Hiroshima. North American children know about Hiroshima. They are taught about the dangers of nuclear war. Sometimes they learn the details of the damage that was done. They learn about what happened at 8:15 a.m. on August 6, 1945. People were eating breakfast. Children were going to school and adults going to work. There was a blinding flash of light, a scorching heat, and a mushroom cloud rose up. People close to the explosion were instantly vaporized. Many of those further away would die from burns and radiation. Sixty thousand houses were destroyed immediately. One concrete structure remained standing, although it was damaged. The local government left the atomic dome standing as a memorial to the explosion. Even those who were not seriously injured in the explosion later became very ill. They became very sick from radiation poisoning. Many developed leukemia. Sadako Sasaki was two years old when the bomb exploded. She was apparently uninjured and grew up normally until she was twelve. Then she developed leukemia, a disease of the blood and bone marrow. Sadako began to fold paper cranes to protect her from the illness. However, she died in 1955 before she reached 1,000 paper cranes. Her example inspired the children's monument at Hiroshima. There is a peace museum in Hiroshima which has objects left by the explosion. These include bottles, metal, stones, and tiles, twisted into strange shapes by the heat. There are objects on which people were vaporized, so that their shape appears like a shadow on the material. There are bits of burnt clothing and many photographs. Why was the bomb dropped? World War II was a long and bitter war. The rules of war, which said not to kill civilians, were forgotten. Hitler bombed London, hoping to break the spirit of the English. Then England bombed Germany to destroy the factories and kill the people who worked in them. Americans wanted revenge for the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The U.S. government had spent six billion dollars developing the A bomb and wanted to use it. Some say that they also wanted to warn the Russians not to cause trouble for America. When American forces advanced on Japan in 1945, they had to decide what to do: would Japan surrender, or would they fight to the last soldier? American leaders feared that they might lose many men by an invasion. Dropping the atomic bomb would end the war very quickly. President Truman made the decision to use it. Since then, most people have felt that this decision was wrong. It was such a terrible thing to do to people, children, old people, women, men, and babies. Hiroshima inspired many people to try to ban the bomb. They wanted to ensure that atomic bombs would not be used again. Even some of the scientists and air crews involved in making and dropping the bomb at Hiroshima wanted it banned. Perhaps, if we can all remember what happened that day, there will be no more Hiroshimas. Cowboys. The golden age of the American cowboy was short-lived. It began in the 1860s with the great cattle drives from Texas north to Kansas. By 1890, when railroads had reached remote areas, there was no more need for large-scale cattle drives. Of course, cowboys have a history before 1860. In fact, there were Mexican cowboys long before that. The Spanish conqueror of Mexico, Hernan Cortez, brought cattle with him in 1521. Cortez also branded his cattle with a three-cross design. The Spanish sharp-horned cattle roamed the deserts and prairies freely. Eventually, they found their way to Texas. American settlers in Texas interbred their animals with the Spanish breed. The Texas Longhorn cow was the result. It was famous for its bad temper and aggressiveness. The Longhorn was a dangerous animal, with each of its horns measuring up to three and one half feet long. 
After the American Civil War ended in 1865, disbanded soldiers who were former black slaves and young men seeking adventure headed west. At that time, there were about 5 million cattle in Texas. Back in the east, there was a big demand for beef. By this time, railways from the east extended as far west as Kansas. It was still more than 600 miles from south Texas to the railway. Between the two places, there were rivers to cross, Indian tribes, badlands, and other problems. A fur trader named Jesse Chisholm had driven his wagon north in 1865. Cowboys and cattle followed the Chisholm Trail north to Abilene, Kansas. This cattle trail became the most famous route for driving cattle until it was barred with barbed wire in 1884. In 1867, cattle dealer Joseph G. McCoy built pens for 3,000 cattle in the little town of Abilene. Soon, Abilene was the most dangerous town in America. After the long cattle drive, cowboys who had just been paid went wild. Sheriff Wild Bill Hickok tamed Abilene in 1871 by forcing cowboys to turn over their guns when they arrived in town. Other towns replaced Abilene as the wildest town in the West, Newton, Wichita, Ellsworth, and Dodge City. In Kansas, a herd of 3,000 Texas Longhorns might sell for $100,000, making the rancher rich. The cowboys might get $200 in wages, which often disappeared on drink, women, and gambling. Getting cattle to Kansas was far from easy. One of the biggest difficulties was getting the herd across rivers, especially when the river was high. There were no bridges. In 1871, 350 cowboys driving 60,000 cattle waited two weeks for the water level in the Red River to go down. Food for men and animals was also difficult to find at times. An early cattleman developed the chuck wagon, which were both a supply wagon and a portable kitchen. In the 1870s, there were probably 40,000 cowboys in the West. After the prairies were fenced in, there was less work. Large ranches still employ cowboys to round up the cattle for branding or for sale. Even today, about 20,000 cowboys still work in North America. Handel's Messiah George Frederick Handel was a native of Germany and spoke with a German accent all his life. Most of that life, however, was spent in London, England. As a young musician, Handel's sponsor was the Elector of Hanover. Later on, when the Elector became King George I of England, he continued to sponsor Handel. The young Handel went to Italy to study opera. Opera had become a very fashionable entertainment for the upper classes. Handel traveled to England in 1711 and made an immediate success with his operas. Queen Anne granted him a royal pension for life in 1713. Because of this initial success, Handel tried to start a permanent opera company in London, but this failed and Handel lost money. Since operas used full stage settings with costumes, scenery, and props, they were expensive to produce. Handel decided to produce oratorios in which the parts were simply sung without actions. On August 22, 1741, Handel began to work on his oratorio, The Messiah. The text was made up of passages from the Bible relating to the birth, life, and death of Jesus. Handel worked on it feverishly, missing meals and going without sleep. He finished it 24 days later. When he was asked how he felt on completing it, Handel said, I thought I saw all heaven before me and the great God himself. In the fall of 1741, Handel received an invitation from the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland to present operas and concerts there. Handel traveled from London to Dublin with his entire luggage and many of his singers. However, in order to rehearse on the way, he had to hire local people to fill in. Once, the composer soundly criticized one local singer who failed to meet his standards. 
Handel was warmly received in Dublin, where his concerts were sold out. Even his rehearsals were considered newsworthy by the local papers. The Messiah was first publicly performed on April 13, 1742. 700 people squeezed into a 600-seat theater to hear it. A notice had requested that ladies attend in hoopless skirts and that gentlemen come without their swords. A Dublin paper reported, Words are wanting to express the exquisite delight it afforded to the admiring crowded audience. All proceeds were donated to charity, as the church choirs had refused to participate except on those conditions. Handel returned to London in August 1742 and prepared the oratorio for the London stage. The Messiah made its London debut on March 23, 1743, with King George II in the audience. It was during the Hallelujah Chorus that the king jumped to his feet and so initiated a tradition that has lasted ever since. With such oratories, Handel was able to re-establish his popularity and restore his finances in London. The Messiah continued to be performed. After conducting it on April 6, 1759, the old composer collapsed and had to be carried home. He died eight days later. The Messiah remains Handel's most popular work, combining wonderful music with inspiring religious sentiments. The biblical text speaks of hope and salvation, and the music allows the text to soar into angelic songs. Louisa May Alcott New England in the early and middle years of the 19th century had a flourishing culture. People were passionately interested in ideas and education. Most New Englanders were strongly opposed to slavery. They were also concerned about other social issues. New ideas resulted in new kinds of writing. These ideas included the importance of doing what seemed right for them, no matter how different it was from what other people thought. People also believed that nature gave them guidance in our lives and that it was important to live close to nature. These and other ideas were expressed through teaching and writing. Bronson Alcott was one of those who looked at the world in a new way. He looked for work as a teacher so that he could pass on his ideas to others. However, very few parents wanted Mr. Alcott to teach their children, and very few people were interested in hearing his speeches or reading his books. As a result, the Alcott family was very poor. Fortunately for Bronson, he married a very capable and energetic woman. Mrs. Abigail Alcott helped to earn money to support the family and did most of the work involved in looking after the four Alcott girls. The oldest daughter, Anna, was quiet and serious. She rarely got into trouble and was a good helper at home. The second daughter was Louisa May Alcott, who became a writer. She was adventurous and cared very little for rules. She was always saying and doing things that got her into trouble. The third daughter, Elizabeth, was very kind and good-natured. All the others loved her. As a young woman, Elizabeth had a severe case of scarlet fever and never fully recovered. She died at age 23. The youngest sister, May, was talented, but she was rather spoiled. Because there was never enough money, the Alcott girls felt pressure to work at an early age, but this did not stop them from having fun. Louisa wrote little plays that she and her sisters performed at home. They all enjoyed the woods and ponds around Concord, Massachusetts, where they lived most of these years. When they moved back to Boston in 1848, Anna took a job looking after other people's children and Louisa looked after the house. Meanwhile, their mother worked outside the home. While working on laundry or sewing, Louisa was thinking up stories. At night, she would write them down. When she was 18, she began selling poems and stories to magazines. Within 10 years, Louisa was earning a substantial income from writing. One day, her publisher suggested that she write a story for girls. At first, 
Louisa didn't like the suggestion, but when she started to write, the ideas came rapidly. Her book was based on her own family and her own childhood. Little Women was published in 1868 and was an immediate success. The March family was very much like the Alcotts. Mrs. Alcott resembles Marmy. Meg is like Anna, and Joe is like Louisa herself. Beth is based on Elizabeth, and Amy on May Alcott. Many of the situations in the book happened to the Alcott family. Nonetheless, many characters and incidents were invented. Little Women and its sequel opened up a new kind of writing for children. While these books did have a moral, they were more lively and interesting than earlier children's writing. Little Women inspired many writers later to write more realistic accounts of childhood. Newspapers. All the great cities in the world now have newspapers, but newspapers as we know them today are not that old. The very first newspapers began long after the invention of printing. They started in Europe in the 1600s and were usually only a couple of pages long. For a long time, newspapers were not very common. Governments didn't want public discussion of their policies and decisions. Often, they closed down papers or taxed them heavily. The stamp tax on newspapers and pamphlets was one of the causes of the American Revolution. Newspapers began to grow in size when they discovered advertising as a source of income. Nowadays, advertising is the main revenue source for most newspapers. As newspapers became more widely circulated, they could ask for more money for their advertisements. By the late 18th century, newspapers were in common use in Europe. The 1800s and early 1900s was the golden age of newspapers. Improvements in transportation, communication, and printing processes made it easier to collect news from near and far, and to publish papers more quickly and more cheaply. The Weekly Dispatch and the Times, both of London, England, were leading newspapers through much of the 1800s. The Times was one of the first papers to include illustrations. It was the first newspaper to use a steam engine to turn the presses. When the tax on newspapers was reduced in 1836, the Times was able to increase its size considerably. In 1840, it began to use the telegraph to collect news stories. In 1855, the tax on newspapers was finally lifted. The Times made its greatest reputation during the Crimean War between Britain and Russia. British armies fighting in Russia's Crimean Peninsula were not only unsuccessful in the war, but were suffering severely from illnesses. The Times sent out the world's first war correspondent, William Howard Russell, in 1854. His reports from the battle lines had a powerful effect on the British public. A war fund was organized to help the soldiers. Russell forced the government to accept the offer of Florence Nightingale to organize nurses to travel to Crimea. A photographer, Roger Fenton, sent back photos from the war, which were published in the Times. Meanwhile, in America, a more popular approach to newspapers had developed. The newspaper had spread west with the pioneers, and nearly every little settlement had its own paper. American newspapers were cheaper and livelier than British ones. They were aimed at the average person rather than the governing class. Examples of the new style of editing and publishing were Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. Hearst, especially, employed sensational and emotional writing, which aimed at stirring up the public to action. Hearst is sometimes accused of starting the Spanish-American War of 1898 with his overheated editorials. Nonetheless, his methods were successful in raising circulation and were widely imitated. 
The modern newspaper contains more than hard news. In fact, news may be a fairly small part of it. Advertisements, gossip, show business, photos of celebrities, sports, stock market prices, horoscopes, comic strips, weather reports, and much more are found in its pages. The modern newspaper is a total entertainment package. A question for the future is whether electronic newspapers will replace paper newspapers. Plains Indians. The best-known picture of an American Indian is a warrior in buckskin, riding a horse, wearing a headdress of eagle feathers, and carrying a spear or bow and arrow. This is a picture of a plains Indian. And it appears in many Hollywood westerns and on the American five-cent piece. There were many tribes of Plains Indians. For the northern American prairies or plains stretch from the northern forest of western Canada down to the states of Oklahoma and Texas in southern USA. It's interesting that our image of the Plains Indian is only true for the last couple hundred years. It was not until the 1600s that Plains Indians began to ride horses. There were no horses in America until Spanish soldiers brought them in the 1500s and 1600s. Some of these horses escaped and ran wild on the prairies of America. It was these wild horses that the Plains Indians learned to tame. Before they had horses, the Indians hunted buffalo on foot. Buffalo were huge bison or wild cattle which traveled in very large herds. A big herd might have millions of buffalo. It was difficult to cross the prairie because these animals blocked your way. The Plains Indians had various ways of killing buffalo. Before they had horses, Indian hunters would quietly creep up close to the herd. Then they would fire their arrows together. There was always the danger that the herd would stampede and trample the hunters. Another method was to drive the buffalo over a steep cliff. There are a number of places on the plains where this was done. Once the plains Indians had horses, they preferred to hunt buffalo on horseback. When the tribe started to use guns, they could kill many buffalo. Artist Paul Kane describes a buffalo hunt in the Red River Valley in 1846. The hunters carried their bullets in their mouths so that they could shoot faster. They could ride right into the herd, shooting at close quarters. They would drop an article of clothes on the slain buffalo to mark it for themselves. Then they would continue the hunt. After the hunt, the Indians would skin the animals, and the women would dry the meat and store it in fat. A single hunt might kill more than thirty thousand buffalo. The Plains Indians received nearly everything they needed from the buffalo. Of course, they used buffalo meat for food. They also used the buffalo skins for clothing, blankets, and the covering of their teepees. These teepees were cone-shaped tents, which were easy to put up and take down. The Plains Indians were nomadic and followed the animals they hunted. Since these animals were plentiful, Plains Indians usually led a comfortable life. They developed complex religions and social rituals, as well as specialized societies or clubs. There were also rituals and customs for hunting and warfare. Many Plains Indians fought hard against the settlement of the Great Plains. The American government discouraged the hunting of buffalo because without the buffalo, the Plains Indians would not be able to fight. With the buffalo disappearing. The Plains Indians had to give up fighting and move into government-sponsored reservations. Remember the Alamo. The first Europeans in the American Southwest were Spanish explorers and conquerors. They were followed by religious orders that set up missions to Christianize the Indians. One of these missions was San Antonio de Valero. It was founded in 1718 in what is now San Antonio, Texas. Later, the mission structure became known as the Alamo. In 1821, Moses Austin had persuaded the Spanish authorities to give him a charter to settle 200,000 acres in Texas. The elder Austin died shortly after this. Five weeks later, his son Stephen Austin traveled to San Antonio to have this charter confirmed by the Spanish governor. 
In 1822, Austin led 150 settlers into Texas. When Austin learned afterwards that Mexico was now independent of Spain, he journeyed to Mexico City to have his charter reconfirmed. The Mexicans appointed Austin regional administrator for his colony. Texas grew rapidly. Cotton farming and cattle ranching were profitable and attracted American settlers. By 1830, there were 16,000 Americans in Texas, four times the Spanish-Mexican population. Sam Houston had been a successful soldier and politician. He was a friend and supporter of President Andrew Jackson. However, personal problems and political difficulties led him to leave the USA for Texas. Meanwhile, the struggle for control of Mexico had been won in 1833 by Santa Anna. However, the independent thinking of the Texans infuriated Santa Anna. He had Stephen Austin thrown in jail and sent an army into Texas. Austin was released from jail in time to organize the defense of Texas. The Mexican army was besieged inside the Alamo and, after fierce fighting, surrendered. The Mexicans were allowed to go home. Sam Houston was now elected the state's supreme commander. Not long after this, Santa Anna approached Texas with an army of six thousand men. Houston decided not to meet Santa Anna in open battle, but to wait for an advantage. He sent frontiersman Jim Bowie to the Alamo. Bowie's orders were to leave San Antonio and destroy the Alamo. When Bowie arrived, however, Texas volunteers were preparing the Alamo for a siege. Bowie and his men pitched in to help. Other volunteers came. The fiery William Travis arrived with twenty-five men. Then the famous frontiersman Davy Crockett came with a dozen Tennessee sharpshooters. When Santa Anna attacked, there were one hundred eighty-three Americans inside the fort. Santa Anna brought up cannon to bombard the Alamo. As the walls began to crumble, four thousand Mexicans attacked from all four sides. The Mexicans overcame all resistance because of their large numbers, but they suffered very heavy losses. All the American defenders were killed. While the battle was raging, the Texans back at the colony declared their independence from Mexico. Sam Houston now gathered men to fight the Mexican army. At first, he retreated while waiting for a suitable opportunity. When Santa Anna's rapid advance left the bulk of the Mexican army behind, Houston prepared to fight. Santa Anna's advance troops moved into swampy land by the San Jacinto River. Houston's men attacked while the Mexicans were having their midday siesta. Their battle cry was, "Remember the Alamo." The battle was soon over. Many Mexicans were killed, but only a couple of Texans were killed. Santa Anna was a prisoner. Santa Anna readily agreed now to recognize Texas as an independent republic. Ninety years later, in 1845, Texas became the 28th state of the USA. Summertime in North America, July and August are holiday months. Most schools and colleges are not in session then. Families look for activities to keep the children amused. Although not all workers get a full two months of holidays, most people take a holiday in the summer. The summer begins with a national holiday. In Canada, July first is Canada Day. In the USA, July fourth is Independence Day. A lot of families are soon on the road. Some travel to cottages by the lake. Some go sightseeing or camping. In Canada, especially, the summers are short, so people try to make the most of them. In much of Canada, and parts of the northern USA, are woodlands dotted with lakes. These regions of rocks, rivers, pine trees, and wild animals are not usually suitable for farming. However, they are ideal places to spend a summer holiday. They are far from the cities. The woods are quiet and peaceful. People fish. Go boating or swimming, have barbecues outside, or play outdoor sports. Some people spend their whole summer at the cottage; others go for a week or two. City people who don't have a cottage like to go to parks and swimming pools in the city. 
If they are near a lake or ocean, they may go there for the day. Many museums, libraries, and art galleries have programs for children in the summer. Swimming is probably the favorite summer sport. It feels wonderful on a very hot day to jump into the cool water. Swimming is also excellent exercise. Besides swimming, baseball and football are also popular in the summer. Spending an afternoon or evening at a baseball game is a favorite summer pastime. Summer is also a favorite time to catch up on reading. Stories of adventures and love novels are favorite light reading. But summer is especially a time for traveling across the country. Some people have a camper or trailer that they can live in. Some stay in campgrounds and sleep in tents. Others stay at hotels or motels, while others rent cottages or cabins for a week or two. Most trips are by car. Many people visit national parks and other wildlife areas. Of course, trips along the ocean and the lakes are favorites. Along the Atlantic Ocean, the coasts of New England and Canada's maritime provinces are especially popular. On the Pacific Coast, tourists travel from California all the way up to Alaska. Boat cruises along the shores of British Columbia and Alaska are especially popular. Of course, some people find it most relaxing just to stay at home. Others cannot afford to travel. If you have an air conditioned house with a television, video player, CD player, and computer, then it can be very pleasant to stay at home. A lot of new movies are released at the theaters in the summer. Air conditioned theaters with new movies and lots of pop and popcorn are favorite summer places. After two months of summer activities, most people are ready to go back to school and work, but they usually have lots of happy memories to take back with them. Texas. The state of Texas is famous for having the biggest and best of everything. Before Alaska became a state, Texas was the largest American state. It was also famous for its huge cattle ranches. Cotton is a major crop, but much of the wealth comes from oil and gas. People think of Texans as being wealthy because there have been lots of cattle and oil millionaires. In the late 19th century, Texas cattlemen used to drive their herds north to Kansas. There, a train to the east shipped the cows. Eventually, the railroad came to Texas, and the great cattle drive stopped. By then, many Texans owned large ranches and were quite wealthy. In the 20th century, oil has made many Texans wealthy. Oil refining has led to chemical industries and synthetic products. Most Texans now live in cities. Many oil companies have their headquarters in Dallas. Other large manufacturing cities are Houston, Corpus Christi, Fort Worth, and Austin, which is the capital of Texas. Several cities, such as San Antonio and El Paso, have a strong Spanish influence. This dates back to the first Spanish visitors in the 16th century. The old mission at San Antonio is famous as the Alamo, where an important battle for Texas independence was fought. Texas is a huge area with mountains, deserts, prairies, rivers, and islands. The rugged beauty of its grasslands and deserts attracts many tourists. For a state that is mostly dry, Texas has a remarkable variety of wildflowers in the spring. Its animals and birds differ from other parts of the USA. Texas has the armored insect eater, the armadillo, the swift running bird, the road runner, prairie dogs, jackrabbits, kangaroo rats, wild pigs, horned lizards, and 100 species of snakes. As might be expected, also, it has many beautiful kinds of cacti and other desert plants. At its largest, Texas is more than 600 miles wide by 600 miles long. Such a large area develops a distinct culture of its own, and Texans are widely recognized by their accent and manner of speaking, their attitudes and interests, and their sense of independence and self reliance. Texas is also known for its beautiful women who regularly win national beauty contests. Its men have a reputation for being rugged. For not talking more than they have to, and for being straightforward and honest. 
Although many people think of cowboys and Indians when they think of Texas, it is a center for high-tech industries. The American Space Program has its headquarters in Houston, and Mission Control Center is there. Texas is also an important manufacturer of computers and other high-tech products. Oil production is still important in Texas, but it ranks third as a source of revenue behind manufacturing and tourism. The colorful history of Texas and its wonderful scenery contribute to a thriving tourist industry. Texas is also an important business and financial area. Yes, even though times have changed, Texans proudly maintain that their state still has the biggest and best of everything. The Golden Man, El Dorado. When Christopher Columbus sailed west from Spain in 1492, he was trying to reach the Spice Islands, which today are called Indonesia. Spices were very scarce and valuable in Europe at this time. No one knew that two vast oceans and the American continents lay between Europe and Asia. Columbus did not find spices in America, but he did bring home some gold trinkets. The American Indians wore these as jewelry. Gold, not spices, was to become the biggest motive for exploration. Expeditions into the interior of the Americas were very costly and very risky. Only by promising the authorities huge profits could sailors and soldiers raise money for their expeditions. They also needed to promise rich rewards in order to get followers and crews. If a leader returned to Europe without gold and jewels, he might end up in jail. No wonder the Spanish conquerors were always searching for gold. At first, the Spaniards stayed around the coasts of the Caribbean Sea, but stories of gold in the interior tempted them to explore inland. They asked the Indians where their gold jewelry came from. The Indians would point further inland. They said that a wealthy people lived in the high mountains that traded gold and emeralds for pearls, cotton, and shells. The Spanish emperor had given the rights to exploit present-day Venezuela and Colombia to his German bankers in 1528. So Germans Dalfinger, Featherman, and Hohermuth led a series of expeditions into the jungles, grasslands, and mountains. Meanwhile, Spanish conquerors had found immense riches in gold and silver. Hernando Cortez had captured the kingdom of the Aztecs in Mexico in 1519. He had sent immense treasures to Europe. Soon after this, Francisco Pizarro began to explore the west coast of South America. In 1531, Pizarro invaded Peru and destroyed the kingdom of the Incas. Pizarro melted down the gold and silver treasures of the Incas and sent gold and silver bricks back to Spain. The rush to find more gold became very heated. Rumors came down from the mountains of Colombia about a golden man, El Hombre Dorado. There were stories about a king so rich that he wore gold dust instead of a coat. Colombia was the kingdom of the Chipchas. They were a trading people who traded salt and emeralds for gold, cotton, pearls, and shells. The actual gold did not come from their kingdom. It was found in the mountain rivers and brought to the Chipchas for refining and metalwork. Several armies converged on Chipcha territory. The first to arrive was the Spaniard Quesada, coming up the Magdalena River from the Caribbean. He found the chief cities of the Chipchas and seized their gold and emeralds. Shortly afterwards, one of Pizarro's captains arrived from Peru and Ecuador. Then the German Federman arrived from Venezuela. Quesada gave the latecomers some gold and jewels to ease their disappointment. Casada's men also found out about the Golden Man. High in the mountains was a lake created by a meteorite. The Indians believed that the Golden God from the sky now lived at the bottom of the lake. When a new leader of the tribe was elected, he was covered in grease, and fine gold dust was blown over his body so that he appeared to be made of gold. He was taken out to the middle of the lake on a raft. He would jump into the lake and stay in the water till the gold dust was washed off. It was considered an offering to the god. Gold ornaments were also tossed in the lake. Then the king and his followers would return to the shore. The ceremony was stopped several generations before the Europeans arrived.
Many people were unwilling to believe that this was the whole story. They began to search for a golden city hidden in the jungle. Many explorers perished in this search. In their search for gold, the Spanish conquerors destroyed the great Indian civilizations of America. Towns and villages had been ruined. Thousands of people killed, and wonderful pieces of art melted down. Some Indians believed that gold must be a food that Europeans desperately needed to stay alive. In many cases, the Europeans destroyed the trading and social systems that had produced their wealth. When we think about the great achievements of a few conquerors and explorers, we are also sad about how much death and damage they caused. The Niagara Parks Commission. Niagara Falls, Canada, became a major tourist attraction in the mid 1830s. By this time, roads, canals, and railways were able to bring people from urban centers like New York and Boston. However, the chance for big profits attracted dishonest businessmen. One hotel in the 1860s was popularly known as the Cave of the Forty Thieves. There were many complaints from tourists about tricks that were used to get their money. Some businessmen tried to put up fences around the falls so that all visitors would have to pay them to see the falls. In time, these complaints reached the ears of important people. In 1873, Lord Dufferin, the Governor General of Canada, proposed that the government buy all the land around the falls. On the American side, New York State bought 412 acres around the American Rainbow Falls in 1885. In the same year, land was bought near the Canadian Horseshoe Falls and named Queen Victoria Park. A commission was formed to obtain control of all land along the Niagara River. This was made easier because a narrow strip along the river was already government land. However, the commission wanted to preserve all the beautiful scenery along the river and near the falls for the general public. The first commissioner of the park was Sir Kazimierz Gzowski, a distinguished engineer of Polish birth. Before the Queen Victoria Park Commission began to buy up land besides the falls, tourists had to pay for everything. There were no public washrooms, no drinking fountains, and no safety barriers around the falls. As a result, it was not uncommon for tourists crowding close to the falls or hypnotized by the flow of the river to step too close and fall in. The commission took care of these problems and also set up parks and picnic areas. In 1927, the commission's name was changed to the Niagara Parks Commission. It now supervises numerous attractions and parks from Niagara on the Lake on Lake Ontario. Down to Fort Erie on Lake Erie. Each section of the 56-kilometer stretch of Niagara Parks has its own places of interest. These are joined by the Niagara Parkway, a road that runs the whole length of the river. Sir Winston Churchill called the Parkway the prettiest Sunday afternoon drive in the world. The Niagara Parks Commission operates restaurants, parks and gardens, rides, museums, and historic houses, golf courses. Native sites and gift shops. Near the falls are restaurants, parks, greenhouses, the journey behind the falls, and the Maid of the Mist boat ride. North of the falls at Niagara Gorge are the Spanish Arrow car ride and the Great Gorge Adventure. The commission also operates a school of horticulture with large gardens. Queenston Heights is a park commemorating one of Canada's heroes, General Isaac Brock. In nearby Queenston are historic houses connected with two other important Canadians, Laura Secord and William Lyne Mackenzie. The commission also operates two historic forts dating from the War of 1812, Fort George and Old Fort Erie. The Niagara Parks Commission has played a major role in making Niagara Falls and the Niagara River one of the leading tourist areas in the world. The commission shows how governments can work to make visits to natural wonders like Niagara Falls a good experience for the general public. Walmart stores. Walmart is now the world's largest retail organization. Walmart employs around 1.2 million people worldwide. In 2000, Walmart had sales of more than 191 billion dollars, with profits of 6.3 billion dollars. 
profits increased 16 percent from the previous year. People have come to expect that Walmart's profits will increase substantially every year. Each year, more stores are opened and Walmart expands into new countries. Walmart also enters new areas of business nearly every year. Few people know that Walmart is also a major real estate company. Sam Walton opened his Walton's Five and Dime in Bentonville, Arkansas, in 1950. Twelve years later, he opened the first Walmart in Bentonville. His business philosophy was simple: good prices, great selection, and a friendly greeting. Walton was known for the ten-foot attitude. This means that any employee should greet any customer who is within ten feet of them. He emphasized that it is important to speak to people before they speak to you. Walton also believed that good deals from suppliers should be passed along to customers. The combination of low prices and friendly service is basic to Walmart's success. That one store in Bentonville has become 4,203 stores in the USA, plus another 1,000 outside the United States. Walton died in 1992, but his business philosophy continues to be preached at Walmart's. Each store has greeters who meet the customers at the door and deal with any special needs they have. Having greeters gives the effect of having more service clerks than Walmart really has. Compared to some other department stores, Walmart has relatively fewer employees. Walmart also has the Walmart Foundation, which sponsors numerous good causes. Among their programs are high school scholarships, fundraising for local hospitals and sick children, environmental concerns, and community matching grant outreach. So, what's not to like about Walmart? The main complaint is that their business style is extremely aggressive. Walmart's attitudes towards manufacturers and suppliers are. You do it our way, or we won't do business with you. This puts Walmart at an advantage over smaller retails who don't have the same retailing power. Walmart has been known to demand that its suppliers provide products at discount for Walmart store openings, levy fines for shipment errors, tell manufacturers what products, styles, and colors to make, etc. Walmart expects product delivery in two days and expects manufacturers to cooperate with its promotional and retailing strategies. In effect, any company that works with Walmart becomes one of their employees. Any company which so dominates one area of the market will have a lot of power. So far, Walmart has been successful in getting what it wants and providing customers with what they want. Student newspapers. In North America, most colleges and universities, as well as many high schools, have a student newspaper. These newspapers focus on happenings at the school. They inform the student population about activities on campus and often include world news, which is relevant to student interests. In addition, there are opinion pieces by the student editors, which reflect their views on the school and the world. Sometimes these editorials oppose the way that the school is being run. Occasionally, school officials will try to shut down or censor student papers if they find their writing embarrassing or offensive. But usually, these disagreements are resolved by discussion. At some colleges, the student newspaper is connected to a professional program in journalism. But most of the time, the idea behind the paper is to get students to research the facts, debate the issues, and learn how to get their opinions expressed. If these students go on to become professional journalists, that is fine, but it's not really expected. You might wonder whether enough things happen at a college to fill out a weekly paper. Yes, indeed, schools and universities reflect the real world. There are often problems with the budget and cuts to programs. New buildings go up or are torn down. Policies change. Tuition goes up. Classrooms become crowded, and personnel come and go. University morale and funding often reflect government policies and social attitudes. These tie the college to the larger world. Editorials often comment on how national and world events affect the university. 
At the same time, there are many things going on within the university. Construction disturbs classes. Offices are broken into. Computers are stolen. Accidents happen in the parking lot. Students die on the roads during the holidays. Sports teams win or lose. Graduation takes place. Students and instructors win awards. Plays are put on. Distinguished visitors speak. Rock bands are in concert. Then there is always the question of student rights and responsibilities. What kinds of student behavior are unacceptable? Should the university pay attention to student activities off campus? Committees meet with student representation to set guidelines for these matters. Another issue is who sets the agenda for the university. Corporate sponsors today are buying exclusive rights to distribute their products on campus. Governments are expecting universities to follow official policies in order to receive funding. Social groups are demanding that university policies reflect their special interests. So there is no shortage of topics for student journalists to address. Of course, they also write about everything that young people are interested in: music, movies, computers, sports, travel, and pop culture. Student newspapers are an important training group for democracy. They are also very interesting to read. Coffee and donuts. Let's go for coffee. All over North America, friends like to meet at the coffee shop. Here, people sit and talk about the day's business, news, and sports, personal concerns, shop talk, or simply gossip. Coffee shops have an informal atmosphere that encourages conversation. You don't have to dress up either. Students drop in wearing T-shirts and blue jeans and sit beside businessmen wearing suits and ties. Many coffee shops are open 24 hours a day, including Sundays and holidays. That way, people who work at night or who have trouble sleeping can drop in at any time. Because coffee and donuts are relatively inexpensive, people feel comfortable sitting for a while, knowing that they are not spending a lot of money. Although coffee and donuts are the main items sold at coffee shops, many also serve other beverages and desserts, and sometimes a light lunch. Many patrons have a favorite kind of coffee or other drink, and will drive past other coffee shops to go to one that serves the flavor they like. Visitors from other countries are often surprised at how roomy these coffee shops can be. Some are as large as regular restaurants. Having a nice bit of space around them encourages people to relax. Some people arrange regular dates and meet every day or every week at the same time. For example, retired friends may get together every weekday morning at 10 a.m. Others stop every morning at the drive-in line to get their coffee for work. Even people who have coffee machines at home or at work like to go to coffee shops to get a special kind of coffee. Or a favorite treat. It might seem that the business owners would not make much money just selling a few items, but in fact, many coffee shops do extremely well, especially if they are located in a busy traffic area. Then business tends to be steady all through the day. Not only do people come in and sit down, but there is usually a lot of takeout business as well. People go to coffee shops not only to socialize with family and friends, but also to discuss business or treat their employees to a snack. Others go there to read the newspaper or a favorite magazine. Some people even go there to do work. This article was written in a coffee shop. Of course, people who come here usually like coffee and donuts. Coffee is the favorite hot drink in North America, but most shops also serve tea, hot chocolate, and cappuccino, as well as some other cold beverages. Donuts are usually round and are small, deep-fried breads with various toppings. Most donuts have a hole in the middle. Even these holes, which are punched out of the donut, can be sold separately as a kind of mini donut. Everywhere you go in North America. You will see coffee shops, so take half an hour to stop in and relax. You'll enjoy the great North American coffee break. 
favorite cookies. North Americans are known for their sweet tooth. This means that they like snacks with lots of sugar. Americans drink a lot of coffee, tea, and hot chocolate, and usually they have something sweet with their drink. Cookies are one of America's favorite desserts. The word cookie comes from a Dutch word meaning little cake. People from Europe brought their favorite recipes with them when they came to America. The English brought their custom of having tea in the afternoon. Usually, with their tea, they would have cakes or biscuits. Biscuits are usually hard wafers, like, for example, ginger snaps. In fact, the Italian slang word for Englishman is cake eater. In the early days, all cookies were homemade, but in the late nineteenth century, biscuits began to be manufactured in large quantities by machine. In 1912, the National Biscuit Company (Nabisco) in the USA introduced Oreo cookies. This cookie has a rich cream vanilla filling between two crispy chocolate wafers. This product was designed to meet the demand for an English-style biscuit. Oreos were good to dunk in a drink, to eat whole, to eat in parts, or to use in cooking. Oreos have become both America's and the world's favorite commercial cookie. New varieties of Oreos are added regularly to the original product. Although commercial biscuits like Oreos are very popular, many people prefer home baked ones. In fact, there is a whole line of commercial cookies called Home Style, which try to imitate homemade cookies. The most popular cookie in America can be either bought in a package or baked at home. These are chocolate chip cookies. Ruth and Kenneth Wakefield operated the Toll House Inn in Whitman, Massachusetts. One day in 1930, Mrs. Wakefield ran out of baking chocolate for her baking cookies. She broke up a chocolate bar and added the pieces to her cookie mix. She expected that the chocolate bits would melt into the dough when she baked them, but they didn't. Soon, chocolate chip cookies were being made commercially by adding small chunks of chocolate to regular chocolate cookie dough. Lots of people like to make their own by adding commercial chocolate chips to their dough. Now, chocolate chip cookies are the most popular kind of cookie in North America. Over seven billion are eaten annually here. Half of all the cookies baked in American homes are chocolate chip cookies. Experiments in baking and packaging have led to new kinds of cookies. Recently, soft cookies have become very popular. Since they are packaged in foil, they can stay fresh and soft for many months. It seems likely that the love of cookies will be around for a long time. Harriet Tubman. Before the American Civil War, the economy of the Southern states was based on the use of slave labor. The social and political leaders of the Old South were the plantation owners. Many of these owned hundreds of black slaves. The slaves were mainly used to pick crops like cotton and tobacco. Harriet Tubman was born in 1820 in the state of Maryland. As a girl of seven, she was sent into the fields to work with the adult slaves. The slaves worked from sunrise to sunset, picking the crops. Often they sang songs while they worked. Slaves were not taught to read or write. It was feared that reading and writing would help slaves to escape the plantations. Harriet Tubman was illiterate. Later in life, when she was in danger of being captured, she picked up a book and pretended to read it. This fooled the bounty hunters. When she was fifteen, Harriet helped another slave to escape. The overseer was so angry with her that he hit her over the head with an iron weight. Harriet. Was knocked unconscious for many days. All the rest of her life, she suffered from headaches and sudden sleeping spells. 
Harriet escaped from the plantation to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Since Pennsylvania was not a slave state, Harriet was fairly safe there. She was able to return secretly to the plantation and bring the rest of her family to freedom. There were already people working to bring black slaves up from the South to freedom. These people, both white and black, used the language of the railroad. Escaped slaves were called passengers. Safe houses were called stations. And the guides were called conductors. Harriet soon became a conductor in the Underground Railway. In 1850, the American government passed a second Fugitive Slave Act. This put more pressure on northern states to return escaped slaves to the south. Because of this, the Underground Railway went further north to Canada. In 1793, Upper Canada, Ontario, had passed a law bringing a gradual stop to slavery. In 1834, slavery was abolished in the whole British Empire. A lot of escaped slaves had come to Canada before 1850, but now nearly all escaped slaves tried to go there. Harriet Tubman rented a house in St. Catharines, Ontario. This provided a shelter for new arrivals. Harriet made about 11 trips from Canada to the U.S. during these years. In all, she brought back about 300 people. Escaped slaves had to travel by night and suffered hardships in bad weather. They had to hide during the day wherever they could. Harriet did not allow any passengers to turn back. That might endanger the whole underground railway. When the slave owners heard about Harriet, they offered a reward for her capture, but no one caught her or turned her in. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, she acted as a spy for the northern states. After the war, she married a black American soldier, Nelson Davis. In 1869, a book was written about Harriet Tubman. Black slaves knew Harriet as Moses. The Bible tells the story of how Moses led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. He led them north to Palestine. In the same way, Harriet Tubman delivered many of her people from slavery and led them north to freedom. Julie Andrews Julie Andrews, born Julia Elizabeth Wells, was born on October 1, 1935. She lived in a small town called Walton-on-the-Thames in England, which is south of London. Her father, Ted Wells, was a teacher, and mother, Barbara, was a pianist and piano teacher. She also played piano for her sister's dancing school. Julie learned ballet and tap as a toddler from her aunt, Joan Morris. By the time Julie was three, she could read and write. When Julie was four, her parents divorced, and Barbara married Ted Andrews, a performer during the war and an excellent tenor. He soon began giving Julie singing lessons. At seven years of age, Julie had an unbelievable range of four octaves. She soon changed her last name to Andrews, the last name of her stepfather. As she grew older, Julie became one of England's most popular performers. In early childhood, Julie loved to play with her two younger half-brothers, but soon went on to stardom. At age 12, Julie was cast in a London play and stopped the show with her remarkable talent. She starred in many different BBC productions during the 40s. Later, she starred in many Broadway plays such as The Boyfriend, My Fair Lady, and Camelot. It was the latter play that Walt Disney made a special trip to New York to see, and he decided then and there that Julie was perfect for the role of Mary Poppins in the film of the same name. Mary Poppins was the high-spirited magical nanny of Jane and Michael Banks, two small British children. Julie also starred in many other films, such as The Americanization of Emily, Hawaii, Thoroughly Modern Millie, and my personal favorite, The Sound of Music. 
In this production, she plays Maria, the lively governess of Austrian naval captain George von Trapp's seven children, Liesel, Frederick, Louisa, Kurt, Brigida, Marta, and Gretel. Another of Julie's talents is writing. Two of her best-known books are The Last of the Really Great Wang Doodles and Mandy. Julie also has five children, a daughter, Emma Kate Walton, from her marriage to Tony Walton, four children from her second marriage to Blake Edwards, two of whom were from Blake's previous marriage, Jennifer and Jeffrey, and two who were adopted from Vietnam, Amy and Joanna. In 1998, tragedy struck Julie. She lost her extraordinary talent for singing due to surgery on her throat in order to remove a benign tumor. A year later, she made an attempt to sing again. However, her voice will never be the same. Julie has recently been on Britain's royal honor list and is now a dame. The Stratford Festival The Shakespearean Festival in Stratford, Ontario, is one of the greatest theatrical festivals in the world. This is the story of how this small town, which is far from any theatrical centers, became so important for drama. For most of its history, Stratford was the county town for the local farming region. It was also a railway center, but it was hardly known for the arts. An Irishman who opened an inn there founded Stratford in 1832. He called his roadhouse Shakespeare's Inn after England's great dramatist. Soon, the little town became known as Stratford after the town in England where Shakespeare was born. The local river was likewise called the Avon after the English River. The little town grew gradually and became the local center for government and law. Stratford people seemed to enjoy the association with Shakespeare. Many streets were given Shakespearean names, such as Arden Park, Portia Boulevard, Romeo Street, and Viola Court. Local schools received names such as Hamlet Public School or Falstaff School. There was still no attempt at Shakespearean theater in Stratford, Ontario. In 1913, the Canadian Pacific Railway threatened to take over the town. They proposed a railway line running through the center of Stratford, which would have taken over much of the town's parkland. The townspeople voted down this proposal. Instead, they expanded the parkland along the Avon River. These parks were enhanced with gardens, and in 1918, a pair of swans was added. These swans were an imitation of the swans on English rivers. In 1950, it appeared that the railway would be closing some of its workshops in Stratford. The town was looking for ideas that might lead to new employment opportunities. This was when one citizen, Tom Patterson, suggested that the town sponsor a drama festival. Patterson was able to get Irish director Tyrone Guthrie to come to Stratford in 1952. Guthrie agreed to head up the 1953 season, Everyone in Stratford pitched in to raise the necessary money and prepare the stage. Since there was no time to put up a building, the plays were staged under a huge tent. Two plays were put on during a six-week season, and with great success. In 1957, a permanent theater was built. The Stratford season in 2001 runs for more than six months, from late April to early November. There are 14 plays in production at three different theaters. Altogether, there are 668 performances, with a total attendance of 580,000 people. About 40% of the audience comes from the United States. Tom Patterson's plan to ease unemployment in Stratford has worked well. The festival has helped to create nearly 6,000 jobs and generate wages and salaries of $110 million annually. In total, the festival brings about $170 million of revenue into the Stratford area. Of course, to the audiences who come back every year, the main attraction is seeing some of the best Shakespearean theater in the world.
The Stratford Festival Company is Canada's leading acting company, and many of its actors have become internationally known. The war that both sides won. Today, the 3,000-mile boundary between Canada and the United States is known as the longest undefended boundary in the world. But for three years in a row, 1812, 1813, and 1814, U.S. armies invaded Canada. When both sides failed to win a clear victory and the costs of the war kept growing, the two countries decided that peace. Was the best policy. On June eighteenth, eighteen twelve, the United States declared war on Great Britain. The United States had proclaimed their independence from Britain in seventeen seventy six, thirty six years earlier. There were still bad feelings between the two countries. Great Britain was not treating the United States as an equal, independent country. British ships were stopping American ships from trading with Europe. British sailors went aboard American ships looking for deserters from the British Navy. If an American sailor could not prove that he was an American, he was taken to work for the British. At the same time, the population of the United States was expanding. Americans wanted to move west into lands held by various American Indian tribes. Some Americans felt that Britain was encouraging the Indians to fight them and was supplying guns to the Indians. In 1812, Canada was made up of a small number of British colonies just north of the American border. Americans felt it would be easy to take over Canada, then Canadian land would provide homes for their growing population. Since Americans outnumbered Canadians ten to one, the U.S. government thought that no one in Canada would dare oppose them. Moreover, Britain was fighting a terrible war in Europe against Napoleon, the Emperor of France, and could not spare any troops to help defend Canada. But in 1812, Canada had one advantage over the U.S.A.: good leadership. British General Isaac Brock had served in Canada for ten years. He knew how to inspire both his own soldiers and the ordinary people of Canada to fight for their country. He was a bold and energetic leader who moved quickly to attack American positions before they could attack him. Brock found a valuable ally in the American Indian chief Tecumseh. Tecumseh had been trying to unite the scattered groups of Indians to fight together against American expansion. He convinced the Indians that their best chance for success was to join the British and Canadians against the Americans. Although both Brock and Tecumseh were killed in battles, their example continued to inspire the defenders of Canada to fight against the American invasions. Before the end of 1814, all American forces had been driven out of Canada. By 1814, Britain had defeated the French Emperor Napoleon. Now it was the turn of the United States to be invaded. A large British force attacked the heart of the United States and burned the government buildings at Washington. Another British force attacked the USA near the mouth of the Mississippi River, but it was defeated at the Battle of New Orleans. Both sides were tired of fighting by this time, and a peace treaty was signed on December twenty fourth, eighteen fourteen. This agreement restored everything to the way it had been when the war began. Although this really meant that no one had won the war, both sides claimed victory. The Americans felt that they had gained full recognition of their independence. Britain would no longer board their ships or encourage the Indians to fight them. Canadians felt that they had shown Americans that they wanted to develop their own country in their own way, separate from the United States. But the biggest result of the war was the decision by both countries never to fight each other again.